Welcome to the Metal Voice. And once again, Alan, who do we got? We've got the one and only Lee Aaron, as Jimmy likes to say. The one and only. Yeah, what a pleasure. There's, there is no other one. I don't think there's another one. <laughs> we should talk to you, Jeff, too. You're, you're two crazy hosers from the East Coast. So. <laughs> I love crazy hosers. It's like a <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> My favorite folks. <laughs> yep, yep. April 26, the release of Tattoo Me. And I just realized something, Alan. I got no tattoos. Yeah, I'm like Andy Kerr, no tattoos myself. Yeah, you too. No tattoos. Sorry, I have you- no tattoos. We are a, a tattoo oh, trio. That's, well, that's incredible. <laughs> I love tattoos, though. I think that they 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 look incredible, especially when people get really cool stuff done. But uh, I managed to. Uh, I, I'm such a rebel. I got through the '80s with no tattoos. <laughs> but but you gotta, I got to say something. The people who had tattoos, like in the '70s, were usually prisoners. Well, so this or is sailors. <laughs> it because I'm a I'll, rebel I'll, thing, right? To get one or sailors, right? You yeah. know, it really meant something. And then, uh, you know, by the or '90s, tattoos were just ubiquitous with a store in the mall, almost like you know what I mean. Like, so not to criticize because I think no. you know I I like tattoo art. I think it's beautiful and amazing. I just it just. Um, the truth be told, I had a, I sort of had this bad boyfriend in the eighties who really pressured me to get a tattoo because he had them and, and, and then we broke up and I was so glad that I, that I was just like, every time I thought about getting a tattoo, I thought about him and I was just like, nah, not happening. <laughs> so, so there you go. To, to quote the immortal David Lee Roth, why is the crazy stuff we never say poetry and ink? Uh, i'm just gonna say one last thing when i was a kid maybe like 10 eight years old and a guy would walk by with a big tattoo my parents would say keep away from him keep away from him he was like the danger like the dangerous person today it's just everyone right but back then it was was, was reserved for a few right that's right it's become so much less dangerous to get one right but uh but maybe perhaps you know evolved into more of like an art art form right so Yeah, yeah Yeah, we're the badasses now. We're the we're rebels the, that don't have any. Oh, yeah. We're the minority. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this uh, covers album. Yeah. Tell sure. us why, why, why now covers? Why, why? Why, 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 why? why? Everyone's been asking me why. Well, you know, I kind of figure at this point in my life and career, people pretty much know I can write a catchy song, right? I've done so many original albums and so many original albums, even just as recently as from, you know, coming back in 2016. And, um, and so I'm just working with a wonderful, amazingly talented creative group of individuals, Sean Kelly on guitar, Dave Reimer on bass, and Mm -hmm. of course my husband, John Cody on drums. And um, we were sitting around after a performance on the Monsters of Rock Cruise last year, just having a dinner, and we're like, what are we going to do next? What's going to be our next fun, cool project? And someone floated the idea of a covers record. It might have been Sean. And we're like, that's a really cool idea. You know, I don't know if, you know, I think interpreting other people's material is a bit of an art form in itself. To be able to pull it off authentically and do it well to make a decision with each song, how far from the original are we going to pull this in our direction, or how far in the you know direction of the original are we going to leave it, so that it sounds authentic for us, that it captures the spirit of the original song, you know, and um, you know that that you know you got to be very sort of conscious of not making fans angry by. Just, yeah. you know, yeah. gutting a tune, right? Like, so when it's a beloved song. So um, it was, it was, it was uh, a real fun project. And, and, you know, almost as much work as an original record, really. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, the musicianship, like you said, it stays respectful to the original. Uh, but I think it's the vocals that really kind of add a little spice or something new to these, these covers. So. Uh, that's the way I read uh, when listening to the album. I thought it was, you know, the music was more respectful to keeping it uh, close to close to the originals. But it's your voice 
and the double tracking. I mean, there's so many squeals and whispers and yells and emoting and everything's there. So. But but to add to what Alan just said, you see, there's also the vocals, but there's a male vocal versus the female vocal, right? So you're a female doing a man's vocal versus doing another female's vocal. So there's a challenge right there, right? Tell us about that challenge. So interestingly enough, when I started, when we made finally made the selection of songs we were going to cover, which, by the way, was sort of fueled by just our fandom of all these bands and um, secondly, by not wanting to choose tunes that were really overdone because, you know, it would have been Man. really easy for me to, you know, and I've said this in previous You want to be wild. Or to do Barracuda, like, but yeah, you can go yeah. on YouTube and see 500 girls singing Barracuda in their basement into mm -hmm. a microphone. So <clears throat> I wanted to make more interesting, artistic and unconventional choices about the material. But when I started examining some of these songs, getting into it, you know, like a song like What Is and What Should Never Be by Led Zeppelin. Um, we chose that because, you know, what I loved about that song is it illustrated the nuanced acoustic beauty of Led Zeppelin, but also that the heavy riffing side of Zeppelin that we all love in, as well. But, you know, I went, oh, I'm listening. I'm going, he's trouble tracked his vocal in those high parts. And I, I as a youth listening to it, I never really, you know, put it under the microscope. And then I went, cool, I'm going to try that, right? And so, um, yeah, like a tune like the Zeppelin tune, we didn't pull it too far away from the original, um, except Sean did do this very cool harmony harmony part to the lead signature lead guitar solo, right? So we tried to, um, like, again, approach these with just um, obviously my voice and more modern production values. And, of course, yeah, someone like me singing the Jet tune it's funny guys because I got asked yesterday, someone said, Why didn't you just change it to, you know, are you gonna be my guy? And I'm like, I don't know, in today's world, do I really need to do that? You know? Yeah. You know, why don't I just thing. leave it? I figured if I you know, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. So just that's leave like, it. That's like Joan Jett in Crimson and Clover, if you remember. Uh she did it the original way. And everybody's like, What? What are you doing? Well, exactly. Does it really matter? But that was yeah. back in the 80s. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> but, it sounds like you had a lot of fun doing, uh, you know, Are You Gonna Be My Girl? I think that's the one that has the most playful vocals out of all the covers. So, Well, I actually floated the idea of that tune. I love that song. I love that band. And, of course, the original vocal performance is just incredible. And I was like, how am I going to pull that off? So I actually had sung a few vocal tracks. And my, I'm like, okay, my voice sounds pretty thrashed right now. It's probably the right time to cut this vocal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what I did. And, and you know, thanks for answering. Uh, out of all the Zep songs, thanks for answering why that one, because that was one of the questions I had. And, but you have a little, almost a seductiveness to that song in your vocals that I found surprising. That song, um, if you Google the meaning, he was apparently either having an affair or considering having an affair with somebody. So there is a very deep, dark, seductive element to that tune that I was trying to bring a little more to life. It, um, so, and well, of you course, you succeeded. <laughs> oh, you <thank> succeeded. You. <laughs> <laughs> I think also with modern production values, you know, the way that. Um, you know, my vocal is EQ'd, you're hearing a little more of that breathy, deep stuff in it, in those verses. And I kept it in the original key, which obviously I'm, so I'm singing lower for my register than, than I normally would be. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and Led Zeppelin's always been cryptic, right? They've always been of a course. cryptic in terms of lyrics and it's, it's jazzy, right? The beginning, the intro is a jazzy little intro that that acoustic part is so jazzy. It suits your voice, right? You know, well, you're doing. the first person that said that, but yeah, absolutely. You know, so it sort of played right into everything I love about rock and roll, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. A whole, yeah, even, yeah. I was going to say Malibu. Like, that's one song that I always liked by Hole, but a lot of people don't know it. It was probably a hit, probably in 92 or 91. And Malibu. One yeah, of the more crazy. popular tracks that we picked. Um, yeah. That was a hit for them, but it's kind of 
It's not like you hear it on the radio ever anymore. It was a hit in just in one or two years, and that was the end of it. Well, that sort of '90s bloom yeah. of stuff, yeah. right? And then, um, and I went, we went back and revisited that, and and I was just like, yeah, this this is a great pop, grungy hard rock song. And uh, what I loved about there that was again putting that a tune under the microscope, even though the original version, you know, you've got you know, Courtney's voice, which was, is a little more punk rock. And then, um, Melissa off the Yeah. Uh, but for Montreal, it, of course she was fantastic. Right. Well, I, I thought hole was as good as Nirvana almost in many ways. They were, they were in their heyday. They were great. Um, and that's, but that song has a lot of beautiful floating background vocals that I never, again, like, so you put it under the microscope and you go, oh, yeah, there's this part that's coming in here and another part that's floating over there. And you're kind of make a vocal map and you're like, yeah, I want to pull some of those elements into it. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of fun recording that one. Even it up, you know, that's for as far as I'm concerned, that's right in your wheelhouse. So uh, what, what kind of influence were the, uh, the Wilson sisters on you? Yeah. Huge. I and again, I'm repeating myself, but I've said many times, you know, they were probably th those girls, and of course Stevie Nicks and Christine McPhee were my number one inspiration for becoming a, a girl rocker. When I was a teenager growing up, you know, they were, you know, they were my era. Like Joplin was a bit before my era, even though I loved her. You know, um, they were really my era in that. You know, growing up in the the the, the mid to late seventies. And um, you know, what I loved about all of those girls um, was the fact that they were they were part of a band. Yeah. They were they played instruments. They co-wrote the songs. They were on equal footing with the men. They were a voice in the band, um, and that that they didn't trade on their sexuality. You know, even though I was kind of a victim of some bad 80s marketing, but, you know, they didn't train on their sexuality to, um, to be honest. And everything about what they did was what embodied what I wanted to be. And so they're, they're, they're badass. I remember when Nancy totally Wilson, badass. they did Crazy on You and she comes out with her acoustic guitar, she starts playing, and you go, Are women supposed to be playing acoustic guitars like that? Like you second guess yourself because back then, no one yes and and the answer like, badass, unequivocally badass. the you answer know? unequivocally is yes you know <laughs> and after that, i was just like i want to be that you know um so yeah they huge they were hugely influential to me to answer yeah, that yeah, question yeah. i just noticed there's not too many songs from the 80s right i don't know about connection or teenage kicks i'm unfamiliar with that but you know a pat benatar in there would have would have been uh, maybe right up your alley as well <laughs> Next one. Next one. Tattoo, oh, yeah. Tattoo me too. Tattoo me too. A couple of people asked me, they said, why didn't you just do like 80s? Why didn't you do like something from Alice Cooper and like like Poison or, you know. Uh, the you Number know, of the Beast. Or... The and Number I... of the Beast. Run to the Hills. Iron Maiden. That would have been a cool one. It's okay. This is for the next one. We're just giving you ideas. <laughs> We're brainstorming. Love it, We're love brainstorming. It. No, but but it isn't my body. You know, I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan. So, is it my body? I mean, that's another one that if it's a man singing or a woman singing, doesn't really make a difference. It's just, it's just a great song either way. Well, it is a great song, but I think it does make a difference with a woman singing. You know, um, you know, when he was saying, "Is it my body?" You know, I think he was being ironic and sassy, and for me to sing it, it you know, especially if it was back then, it would have meant something completely different. But um, yeah, I think it's a little bit of a uh, a girl's take on that was a good one, and I I love that I love those early Alice Cooper records. They're just like almost bordering on a little bit punk rock, right? Because <laughs> it was so raw and visceral before he got more polished, right? I love that early Alice. So. Did you meet? They got Alice? me. They got me there. Sorry. Did you ever meet Alice? Alice Cooper. So. My Alice Cooper connection, unfortunately, is no, I've never met him. But my husband wrote a book called Happy Forever, the, the illustrious life and times of Mark Volman, the um, turtles. singer of the turtles. And, and Alice Cooper, he interviewed Alice, and Alice wrote a foreword for that book. 
Um, wow. So he has a connection to Alice. When I worked with Bob Ezrin, obviously, in the 80s, you know, I got to dig a little deeper and find, you know, learn some <laughs> cool Alice Cooper stories because he had done, you know, Cooper so and many, Pink yeah. Floyd and it, so many artists. Um, and Sean Kelly, who uh, has his side song project, Crash Kelly, toured with Alice years ago as well. Oh. So it seems like everybody's now met Alice Cooper and my <laughs> dad, except <laughs> me. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot, there was a lot of connective tissue there for us yeah. to choose an Alice Cooper song. Then there's a Fluid Mac, You Can Go Your Own Way. It's kind of like a very, I always found that song sad. It's uplifting, but it's sad at the same time because it was on rumors, right? When everybody was breaking up and hated each other's <laughs> guts in the studio. So I think you tend to pick these types of songs. Well, I think that also made that album fantastic, right? There was a of lot of sexual tension in that music. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, so go your own way. I guess it depends on how you interpret it. Um, you know, I'm always into songs about, um, you know, uh, rising out of a, an oppressive situation and, you know, um, finding your power. And, you know, a song like Diamond Baby from the Diamond Baby Blues album is all about that. It, um, Metal Queen is about that. It's like, I, I'm all about, and, you know, go your own overcoming, way. Overcoming, overcoming, you mean. Right. And I think go your own way is, you know, very indicative of that as well. In, in that, you know, someone is leaving a situation that's not working for them and going, finding their own path and their own power. And so um, I, I think it made perfect sense for us. <laughs> how'd you get uh, on metal queen the video how'd you get that bird to like land on your arm well i gotta tell you a funny story i did an interview <laughs> a couple days ago with um a california magazine called stereo gum and the guy was talking to me he said like of all the songs and videos from the 80s he said like he said that just stands up so well because you know it wasn't a song about um you know sex or cars or girls or you know, Dragons. partying. It was a song about empowerment. And um, we went through that video frame by frame. It was quite, it was quite hilarious, actually, <laughs> um, and fun. And um, there's a bunch of outtakes that exist somewhere. I don't know. You'd really? have to probably dig deep to find them where we could not get that bird to land on my, my, <laughs> my arm. So there's a bunch of outtakes of the bird like coming and then landing on my head and then coming and then flying right past and or landing on the other arm and not the right arm. I think we probably did 10 or 12 takes before it finally landed That's on what the I'm arm. Saying. Like, how, do you, how do you get that? You know, it's like... We had animal wrangle, ang wranglers on the set for that <laughs> video. You? So we oh. had a person who was a dove wrangler and finally the dove landed on my arm. I was just so happy. I leaned over and gave it a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and that ended up being the final scene of the Metal Queen video. So <laughs> then the tarantula, the tarantula, they gave you a tarantula to hold. So, yeah. So the tarantula, like I was a bit, a bit nervous, but I had been warned that it was a very, very friendly tarantula. It never bit anyone. <laughs> yeah, that's it was what they all like. They held it every day, and I was like, okay, I can do this. But the snake wrangler was actually walking with a limp and had an issue and he his snake that snake had coiled on him at a at a, a juncture in the past and he had been injured yeah. so i was just i was pretty freaked out i'm like really is this safe and when i was doing that scene with the snake i'm not i mean it looks like i'm completely calm but i was so not calm i was sort of like <laughs> My heart was pounding out of my chest and I'm going, okay, I'm an actor right now. They had about five or six big men on the crew holding that uh, snake straight so that it was, uh, because that's how they, they bite is they coil and they, yeah. So, so there yeah. you go. A little yeah, I would, I would have chickened out. I would have chickened out. <laughs> But when you're 21, you think you're invincible. Even at 21, I would have checked it out. <laughs> Even at 21. Nothing bad's going to happen. <laughs> we'll use the sword. What's that? We'll use the sword. If there's a problem, I'll just use the sword. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I, I believe that sword was like wooden or something. It wasn't actually a real <laughs> gigantic metal sword. Because at one point in time, I'm actually holding the, I'm doing this, I'm holding the blade. Because I got asked about this a couple of days ago. It's funny, all this stuff's coming back. I wasn't meant to to behead someone. 
I mean, the reason the reason the reason I'm bringing it up because as I'm, you know, we we do our research before an interview, and you you realize it's 40 years since that that video or that album came out, right? It's 40 years. Am I doing my math right here? You are doing your math right. It's insane. It's wow, man, am well, I old? Uh, well, <laughs> club. Join the club. No, we're not loyal. We're only as young as you, old as you feel, sure, right? Of course, but we're man, that was forty fine. years ago. Like, can you, can you, you know what's amazing? Like, now that term has become sort of a, a phrase in the metal community, in a sense, right? Uh, you know, you have all the metal women, they're the metal queens, and it's just become this sort of like this phrase that everybody uses. There was a hit. Remember, there was a cover album, Alan. The metal queen covers. I what was that? Was I'm that just Mark saying Gabriel? that the, it, it's yes, 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 by Crystal Viper. Yeah, yeah, she did a great version of Metal Queen. Yeah. But but her her album was called Metal Queens. I think I think it was called Metal Queens. You know, and I'm just saying that it's amazing that after 40 years, it resonates still. That phrase is still, and especially with you and that video and the song, it's just incredible. Well, yeah, I I believe. I, I don't know. I guess I was the first to coin it, but it's kind of become a ubiquitous phrase to yes, that's uh, define women that perform harder style music, right? So, yeah. you know, I guess it's uh, it's a good thing. So it's never going away. That's what I've learned. Yeah. So I had <laughs> peace with it. At a certain point in my career, um, I probably more in the ninety late mid to late nineties when, you know. The media, with the advent of grunge, they just they they just did an about face. You know, music is cyclical and it does that. Where they were just like, "Oh, sorry, you're associated with, you know, hair mu big hair music or classic rock or anything to do with the '80s." If you had released albums, your career fell off the edge of a cliff in the '90s. It wasn't just me; it was all of those '80s bands, um, and um, so. I went through a phase in my life where I was, I felt a little bit pissed off about being defined completely by that moniker. And I didn't want to play the song in my set. I was just like, this is killing me right now. Like, but it, but it was killing everybody, right? Yeah. And, um, however, in later years, I have been able to talk a lot about that song because I get asked about it consistently because again the lyrics were about feminine empowerment or empowerment in general general and i've got to explain the song and the, the the narrative of the tune was really about pushing back against that 80s sexism with women and men running the, completely controlling and running the industry i mean we had to fight the, the handful of us that were doing hard music in the 80s women we had to fight for every scrap of credibility and respect that we received, not only on the musical front, but also in the boardroom with the with the suits, right? And uh, having the opportunity to talk about that now, I think has completely reframed not only the the name, uh, the, the moniker, but the tune, the tune, and what it stood for as well. So I, you know, I, I'm actually happy to happy to be called that now <laughs> so you were, would you were a trailblazer because nobody yeah. blinks twice these days if somebody like jimmy said a guitar a girl playing guitar as he coined earlier nobody blinks twice now right so consider yeah, yourself and, and a trailblazer you, and that's right you had Hart, and then you had lee aaron you had the doros and then you have so many women today are playing music and they're they're in the boardrooms now you know and and they're the tour managers and they're the on the the, the promoters and uh, it's amazing you know? well and it's it's not it's not bizarre for a girl to be in a band and have cookie monster vocals you know what i mean like right. it's That's become right. you know you're not looked at like some weird anomaly to be doing that because you're not you know wearing a frilly dress and singing folk songs with a guitar you know what i mean not that there's anything wrong with that either no, you know, I love yodeling. Is, <laughs> you love who? Yodeling. yodeling. <laughs> you love yodeling. <laughs> hey, okay. Would, would you ever do a, like a, a Metal Queen 2, like she's back, the, the return of the Metal Queen, something like that? <laughs> a lot of, look, Alice Cooper did Welcome to My Nightmare 2, 
right? Is that what it was called, Alan? Yeah, that's remember. what it was called, yeah. There's been Operation Mindcrime 2 by Queensryche. I mean, there's always that sort of, that second one. You know, would you ever think of doing something like that? Really know about that. <laughs> but one of the things that we've been floating as a band, because it's, I've been getting a lot of, um, I wouldn't say pressure, but um, it's been talked about quite a uh a bit amongst the Liaran team, um, doing uh, another, a, a, like an ultimate collection of Liaran mm -hmm. stuff that encompasses the best of the best of my early career and the best of the best of my comeback career from the mid, you know, 2000s onward. And, um, uh, but like many bands from the 1980s, I signed a certain type of contract back then where I didn't, uh, my masters were owned in perpetuity by someone else. Whoa. That's pr a pretty common story, especially yeah. acts that signed record contracts in the early eighties. So that con th those masters have been sold and are now owned by a Canadian company. I don't want to say anything negative because they're still, you know, someone's still buying it obviously because it's gone into third and fourth pressings of vinyl and CD that's still being sold of my first six albums. So wow. the idea has wow. been floated that maybe what we should do is do it like a Tantrum's version, do a Lee Aaron version, like a newer version. That's what Twisted Sister did, yeah. Well, emulating these songs as authentically and as absolutely, you know, note for note as we can to the originals, but doing them with modern production values, which might be fun anyway, right? And so that's that's one of the ideas on the table right now. So you may see a sort of a Metal Queen 2 Ultimate Collection in the next couple of years that, um, that in, you know, includes stuff like that, as well as maybe some, like we have some tracks kicking around that we've never released from the Elevate album and uh, and a few other, you know, little gems. Okay. Pr promise me that Barely Holding On will be part of that set. That's a, that tune yeah. is unbelievable. Okay, right, take notes. <laughs> barely, Alan says, Barely Holding On. <laughs> <we're> request. Included. <laughs> request. Well, that song was actually a massive hit in Europe. <clears throat> so that, I can tell you it's absolutely on the list so great so there good, you go good, good. you know actually i'm just going to leave you with this a lot of bands have done that they re-recorded their own hits because like you said uh, other companies own their masters for life for forever right in the universe and uh the only way to sort of get any sort of sort of financial benefits out of the songs that you wrote is to re-record them and it makes sense especially if you do them with modern day production and they sound great so much financial benefits because the truth is nobody's really making very much money off well, of that's another story. Story. <laughs> and it would cost us money to re-record them yeah. however it might be simpler than trying to we'd have to do some kind of partnership with the canadian distribution company that owns my first six masters and it just could get complicated that's all and we would, would probably have to remaster them to match the material it's complications with doing both, to be honest. But we just always just love a new project. So the idea of re-recording <laughs> some of it, you know, and maybe putting a little twist on it is something that we think might be fun. <laughs> I'm, sure. um, this is the title I want you to write down for me. Alan put his request, this is my request, <laughs> The Return of the Metal Queen, as that's what it's called. That's what the box set's called. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Oh, oh you're up to a box set now. You'll get back to me. You'll get back to me. You'll get back to me. <laughs> Next to the new album, it's called Tattoo Me. Okay, okay. Let's okay. go back to that. Okay. There so there we go. On and Metalville. On Metalville. So it's released People? on Metalville everywhere in the world except Canada. In oh. Canada, um, it's my own independent label, Big Sister Records. Um, and, but I'm partnering with a, Mon a Montreal company called Propagon. So it's going to make it into all mm -hmm. the brick and mortar stores that it can. And um, I'm also in partnership with Rock Paper Merch. Rock Paper Merch has an exclusive Canadian pressing that will be signed, autographed, and you can always oh. pick up a copy there as well. So. Hey. All right. Pick it up, stream it, yeah. buy it. It's better to buy it. Is it com it's coming out on vinyl, correct? It is. Ooh, It'll be on wow. vinyl and CD. 
Um, so yeah, um, right. I'm excited. Um, my manager called me yesterday. He said, "Oh, I just got the, the 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 Canadian vinyl pressings," and he said the artwork. He said it just looks beautiful. So I'm excited. It's supposed to show up by pure, pure later today at my house. So oh. Oh, so Congrats take a picture again. and post it. I'm sure you will. That's amazing. Anyways, congratulations. Thank you so much for being on again. It's always a pleasure. And a good luck. Give her regards to Sean and everybody as well. So. I will do. I'll say hi to everybody for you. And hey, thanks for the interview and the plug. And it's always awesome talking to you guys. Love it. All right. Congrats again. <laughs>